I heard something. Yeah, it's good for us to make a start. Um, we are live streaming this meeting this morning, so we want to start on time. It's good to see um, those that have been able to gather here. Um, it's been a strange time. It's been quite a while since we've been able to meet together in the church on the Lord's Day. Now, right. Now, we've got a reading from Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. It's verses 1 to 22. Because we don't have Bibles out on the seats, we'll put the reading up on the screen, uh, if that helps. But, and we, the reading will be on the sheets for those at the sides who can't see the screen. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly dis disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that they are rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they'd set them in the midst, they asked them, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realised that they'd been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they'd commanded them to go aside, out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they'd further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. This is God's word, and we do look to God to bless it to us. Right then, now, Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> I want us to have a little look at the passage we read uh, earlier on, and particularly verses 11 and 12. Now, this is our first Sunday back in church, as we know. It's something that many of us have been looking forward to for a long time. Now, why is that? I trust it's not because it's just a tradition, something we've always done, and so we kind of feel, oh dear, there's something wrong here. Uh, I don't normally stay at home on Sunday. I trust also that it's not because of the expectations of others. Uh, if the church reopens and I'm not there, what will they think? The real reasons are much, much more important, aren't they? We gather together so that we can hear God's word and see what it is that the Lord will say to us and what he'll teach us. We gather together to seek God's help 
and blessing in our lives as we pray together and as we pray for others and as we pray that God would be glorified see what God is really like and because of that they would honour him is it okay Steve I've just this has just spoken to me and said one minute and zero seconds are you okay okay Okay, teething problems, excuse me. Um, yeah, so we come together to hear God's word. We come together to seek God. We also come together to thank God for his goodness towards us, particularly his goodness in sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. And it's a real encouragement for us to be able to do this together. So it's lovely to be back together. Now, the passage that we have here in verses 11 and 12 they focus on the central point of all of this. And our point is that people need salvation and that salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. He's the one who died and he's the one who rose again to make our lives better in a way that nobody else can. He's the one who has come to save. Now, without that reality, see that central thing, nothing else we do in church really matters. The church building doesn't matter, and the meetings don't matter, and the singing or the lack thereof doesn't matter, and the praying doesn't matter. It all counts for nothing unless the reality is that there's a way for us to be brought back to God. And what we are taught is that there is a way to be brought back to God. So these things are not just outward pictures or something that it's nice to do. These things have real sense. We don't have to live our lives at a distance from God and under his displeasure because the Lord Jesus Christ has come to save. Now in this passage, uh, by the time we get to Acts chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he's ascended bodily to heaven. And he sent his disciples out into the world to preach good news. That is, that he's the Jewish Messiah, the Saviour of the world. And also, that from heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ is today, he's still working personally and powerfully in the lives of men and women. And what I mean by that is, he's working to make people's lives better. And better in a substantial way that nobody else other than him can do. He's working from heaven today to save. And that's the centre of it all. So in chapter 3, you get an example of that. Peter and John go to the temple, and as they go to the temple, there's a lame man sitting by the temple gates, and he's healed. And the people are amazed at this because they see this man who was begging, walking, and leaping, and praising God, as it says in chapter 3 and verse 8. Now, Peter and John are very, very quick when that happens to tell the people that the man hasn't been healed by some power of theirs. It's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ who's done this, his sovereign power from heaven. And then in chapter 4, when the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, call Peter and John to them to examine the situation and ask them questions, this is what happens in chapter 4 and verse 9. Peter says, If we this day a judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he's been made well let it be known to you all and to all the people of israel that by the name of jesus christ of nazareth whom you crucified whom god raised from the dead by him this man stands here before you whole he makes a couple of points he says look this man was helpless he couldn't heal himself but he has been made well and the word there, made well, is the word saved. He's been saved in this sense. He's been delivered from this illness, this medical condition, that kept him captive. He's been set free from that and introduced into a bed. Jesus Christ who did it. His name, his power, and his authority. He's the one that's done it. 
you know about the Lord Jesus Christ. You crucified him. God raised him from the dead, and he's been exalted to heaven. But today, from heaven, he still does good in the lives of men and women. He saves. Now that's the background here. And then Peter goes further in verses 11 and 12. He says, this Jesus, he's the stone which was rejected by you builders, but he's become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He says, you rejected Jesus, cast him aside, and had him crucified. But real salvation, not just the healing of the body being delivered from those things, but real salvation, the salvation of the soul, forgiveness and being brought back to God, it comes through his name, his power and authority. And it comes through his name alone, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. It's Christ alone who can deliver us from the things that really hold us captive and can introduce us into a fuller and better life, a life of knowing God. So that's what's happening here. Now, the next thing I want us to notice is that religious leaders can go wrong. In chapter 4, when the Jewish council get Peter and John together, they don't deny that a miracle has occurred, and they don't deny that this lame man's life has been irrevocably changed for the better. No problem with that. They know that. They say in verse 16, what shall we do? That a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We can't deny it. It's obvious. But even though they know that, they question them in verse 7, by what power or authority have you done this? And Peter and John tell them, it's in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they threaten them in verse 18. They severely threaten them that from now on they should speak no more in this name, for fear that others will hear and come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, now that's a tragedy. Because the Jewish religious leaders should have been looking for the Messiah, waiting for him, expecting him. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, they should have welcomed him. But instead of that, they try and stop people believing in him. Religious leaders can go badly wrong. So Peter quotes in verse 11 from the Old Testament, from Psalm 118. This is the stone that was rejected by you builders but it's become the chief cornerstone. He says, you cast the Lord Jesus aside, mocked him, ultimately crucified him. And so now you're trying to build the church, you're trying to build the house of God without him. But you have to recognize that that plan is gonna utterly fail. And it'll utterly fail for two big reasons. God has made Christ the chief cornerstone. If you ignore him and try and build, whatever house you're building is not a house of God. Whatever religion you're establishing, whatever church you're setting up, it's not the church that God has determined because the house that God wants to build is a house that sits squarely on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second reason? The house that God wants to build is a house that's filled with men and women who have experienced Christ's salvation. And that's the big point here in chapter 4. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into the world to save men and women. The preaching of the gospel is to build the house of God, to build up the church. But what's the church made up of? It's made up of men and women whose lives and hopes and salvation are grounded wholly and solely on the Lord Jesus Christ. In our circumstances, it's vitally important that we hold on to that, and we don't let the pressures of other things come and take our eyes 
of the things that really matter. You know, it doesn't matter whether we come to the meeting and hear the message or whether we sit at home and hear the message if in both situations it leaves us unmoved and unchanged and unsaved. What matters and have our lives wholly and solely founded on Christ and our hope in him and in him alone. And so we pray that God would bless the messages on the internet and all the other opportunities that we have to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this is the thing which is absolutely essential. Now, two or three little points here. If you want to know whether a religious group or a church is really of God, ask this question. Are they built squarely on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the key. Some groups were never built on the Lord Jesus Christ. He never shaped them at all. They never accepted the biblical truth about who the Lord Jesus Christ is or the work he's done for people on the cross. They've never been there. That's not the house of God in that sense because it's not built on Jesus Christ. But you know, there are other churches that started off well, but over time they wandered away. And that's what's happening in Acts chapter 4. These Jewish leaders well, they're representing Israel, the people of God. There was this big expectation that the Messiah was coming, all through the Old Testament. How is it that now when he's come, they fail to recognize him, and they ignore Christ, and they build a little house of their own? It's a tragedy to start off well and to wander away. But whatever reason, the problem is they are not built squarely on the Lord Jesus Christ. A second thing, it's not acceptable for religious leaders to add something to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some churches emphasize that to be saved and to know God, the Lord Jesus is important, but we need more. For instance, we need to try hard, or we need to be baptized, or we need to give money, or we need to pray. But that's not right. It's not right because it means the house they are building isn't a house that is founded on Christ alone. They make the foundation of the house bigger than God has made it. And so because of that, they make room in their house, they make room in their church and in their religion for people who don't really belong in the house of God because they're not standing on Christ, they're standing on other things. And that's a tragedy that ultimately leads to disaster to make room in the church of Jesus Christ for men and women who think that they can get to God by their own efforts rather than through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's just not right because Christ alone is the cornerstone. He's God in the flesh, mighty to save. He bore our sins on the cross so he can really forgive and he's alive today so that he can really reach down from heaven and save. Third little thing, it's not acceptable when religious leaders take away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happens in Acts chapter 4. The Jewish leaders are very comfortable and happy to accept that a lame man has been healed. That's a but what they don't want is for the apostles to tell people that the Lord Jesus Christ is really interested in healing not the body but the soul. They'll take the good things that Christ does, the schools and the orphanages, the hospitals and the hospices, but they'll restrict it to that. And they'll not make room for the fundamental things, the salvation of the soul. The house they are building, it's a limited, restricted little house. It's got enough room in it for people to do good, but it hasn't got enough room in it to provide refuge for somebody who's struggling with their sins and who knows they need to be forgiven and who knows they need to find peace with God. So that's the first thing. Religious leaders can go wrong. And here's the second thing, only two points this morning. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only saviour. Verse 12 nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Okay. He's the only saviour because he's appointed by God. It's a mistake to think that Jesus of Nazareth was a simple, wandering Jewish teacher whose disciples claimed as the saviour. That's just a mistake. The reality is that he claimed himself to be the saviour of the world, and he did that because his father sent him into the world for that very purpose. The scripture, the Bible, is full of that. The Lord Jesus himself says in Luke 19, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. He knew that was his mission and his purpose, that he's a saviour. And he says in John chapter 6, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that everyone he has given me, out of them I should lose nothing, but raise them up at the last day. He knew he was the saviour, and that was why the Father sent him. He's appointed to be the saviour of men. Another reason is, he's uniquely qualified to be the saviour. Now, lots of jobs require appropriate qualifications, don't they? Um, a doctor, I think we all like to hope that when we go to see the doctor, they've got some inkling of what they're talking about. Certainly when they recommend us for surgery, you know, there are obvious qualifications that are necessary. It's true of ballet dancers and firefighters and all sorts of things, of course. But if this passage tells us that there's no salvation in any other and no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, what qualifications does the Lord Jesus Christ need if he's to be a saviour like that? Well, number one, he has to deliver us from guilt and punishment. Because our problem is we need to be delivered from something greater than physical lameness. We need to be delivered from sin. And sin, as we know, is rebellion against God. Sin makes us guilty before God. And that means that we are liable to punishment. And we feel that when our consciences accuse us. So to be saved means that we need a saviour who can take the punishment that we deserve so that we can be forgiven by God and set free. And in biblical terms, that means we need a sacrifice. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is described in John's Gospel as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he takes away the sins of the world in this way. He takes responsibility for them and he takes them to the cross. And on the cross is punishment. It's like a substitute. Somebody who goes to court to pay somebody else's fine. But for the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to do this, he has to be innocent in himself. When he goes to the cross, it's not for his own sins. He hasn't got any. He has to be able to pay for the sins of others. He needs to be pure and free and sinless. And he is. And nobody else is pure and free and sinless. So nobody else can be an adequate saviour. But as well as that, he needs to be wealthy enough to pay the fine in full. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, become man, so that the sacrifice he offered, the sacrifice of himself, the price that he paid, it was of infinite value in the eyes of God and the scales of God. Just. He is, as we were saying, uniquely qualified because no one else is sinless and no one else is God in the flesh and there's salvation in no other. Another thing, he has to deliver from the power of sin if he's going to be a real saviour. Now sin damages lives. It promises the earth and it feeds us with ashes, the ashes of broken dreams and the ashes of damaged relationships. Sin works like blinkers on a horse, doesn't it? It blinds us to the things that really matter and only shows us certain things, and often they're just lies. Sin holds us as slaves. We know that rebellion is so deeply rooted in our hearts that even though we know the harm it does, we still go back to it. What that means is we need a saviour who can deliver us from ourselves and who can change our hearts. 
and the Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and is alive forevermore. And he sends his Holy Spirit into our hearts when he saves us to change us. He writes his law on our hearts so that we love it. Hotel ways of himself, the one who's listened to us, so the desire to follow him. What was it to do? That is from guilt and punishment. He has to deliver us from the power of sin. But the third thing he has to do is he has to prepare a home in heaven. Because to be resaved means not just to be saved in this life, but to be saved forever. People say we can't possibly know what happens after death because no one's been there and come back to tell us. But that's not true. The Lord Jesus Christ has died and he has come back and he has told us. And he's told us that he's gone to prepare a place for us. And he's told us that he's risen from the dead and that he's conquered death and he's ascended to heaven so that ultimately where he is, there we may be also. See, he's uniquely qualified to be a saviour because he's the only one who can take away sins. Because he's the only one who can change the heart. And because he's the only one who has conquered death. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And as well as that, Christ is supremely successful. Now, as you go through the Bible, you find many, many examples of people that Christ has saved. All sorts of different people. Violent persecutors like Saul of Tarsus who were saved and became preachers. You find quiet, thoughtful women like Lydia in Philippi. You find hardened soldiers like the Philippian jailer. You find religious intellectuals like Nicodemus. You find evil child murderers like Manasseh in the Old Testament. You find women who have been used by men and despised by others, like the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And you find countless ordinary men and women who have felt the weight of their sins and have simply looked to Christ for mercy. But in every case, what we find is that Christ knows how to save them and that Christ has the power and the authority to set them free. And when they trust him, he freely forgives, he powerfully changes, and he gives them the hope of heaven that will never end. And that's the reality today. The house that God is building is a house which is built squarely on the Lord Jesus Christ, the house of salvation, and whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame. And that's why church is so important. Because we gather together to hear the message and to believe it. And we gather together to thank God for it. And to share with one another and bear one another's burdens. Here's the last little point. Christ is an accessible saviour. Because we read in verse 16 that salvation comes through faith in his name. Now, it's all very well if the Lord Jesus Christ is a saviour, but, but he's not willing to save us. Because he is willing to save us. Whoever believes in Christ will be saved. He's going to save us. It's all very well, for, but we need him to ask him for something. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is near to all those who call upon him, to those who call upon him, in truth. It's all very well for the Lord Jesus Christ to be a saviour, but if he expects some of us that can't do what he's prepared, he's lost as ever. But the Lord Jesus Christ has broken all the barriers down. And so the salvation that he offers, he offers as a free gift to men and women who will trust him and simply lean the weight of their souls wholly and solely on him. So this is where we come down, and this is where we so often come down. Faith means to see our need of a saviour, 
to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is uniquely qualified to save us. To recognize that today he's got the authority and he's got the power to forgive sins. And to recognize that if we believe in him, he will save us because he has promised. And then knowing that, simply to confess our sins and to trust him, that he might indeed be the saviour of our souls. And then what so often happens is that men and women find that there is a change. Sometimes a very sudden and dramatic change. Like around walking and leaping and praising God. They know that God has heard them and that God has saved them and it's wonderful. But sometimes it's a slower awareness. Rather than stepping out suddenly into the full blaze of the sunshine of God's love, it's as if somebody's turned a little light on. And there's a little change and there's a little hope in them that wasn't there before. You know, it's still light. It might not be as strong, but it's still light. And it's still showing us that the Lord Jesus Christ is true to his word. And that whoever trusts in him will be saved. So that's my encouragement for us in the building and those who are watching at home today. When we trust in Christ, the power of God for salvation works in our lives. And we know it. We might not know it all guns blazing. But down in our hearts, we're aware that something is different. That the Lord has heard us. And that the Lord has saved us. And that now we are members of the household of God. This great thing that God is doing in the world. Where he's saving men and women from all the nations. And building them up into the church of Jesus Christ. Well, might the Lord help us today. Grace and mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.